Hello and welcome to ID the Future. I'm Casey Luskin with Discovery Institute's Center for Science and Culture in Seattle, Washington. Today we have on the show with us one of our favorite guests, Dr. Michael Behe, professor at biochemistry at Lehigh University and author of the well-known ID books, Darwin's Black Box and The Edge of Evolution. Many of our listeners probably have read The Edge of Evolution and may recall that there was a, an argument that Dr. Behe made about the evolution of resistance to chloroquine in the parasite that causes malaria. And we have Michael Behe on the show with us today to talk about this particular issue and a new paper that's come out in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences USA that bears on his arguments in the book. So, Dr. Behe, thank you for coming on the show with us. Thanks for having me again. It's always a pleasure. Great. Well, first of all, just to give our listeners some background, can you explain for us what is chloroquine and how does it stop the parasite that causes malaria? Okay. Well, chloroquine is a medicine. It's a drug, relatively small molecule. And the way it stops malaria really wasn't known for a long time. But then it was discovered that this drug enters the malarial parasite, which is a single-celled creature. And it's got the equivalent of a stomach in it. And the chloroquine enters the stomach called the digestive vacuole and gums up the digestive process and, and essentially kills it by that method. Now, you talked quite a bit about resistance to chloroquine in the edge of evolution and how sometimes, quite rarely in fact, malaria will become resistant to this drug such that it can no longer kill the parasite. So what did you argue in your book, The Edge of Evolution, about chloroquine resistance in malaria? I pointed out that resistance to chloroquine, that is malarial parasites that have the ability to deal with a drug and not be killed, has developed, but it has taken a surprisingly long time compared with resistance to other drugs. So chloroquine has stood out in that respect. And it turns out that it really requires an astronomical number of parasite organisms in order to stumble across a mutant that has this drug resistance. So the point I was trying to make is that this is probably a good place to look to see what are the limits or, or what can random mutation in natural selection, uh, Darwinian evolution, what can it do when it has an enormous number of opportunities to try out different things? So you're not saying, of course, that chloroquine resistance cannot evolve because clearly it does. What you're saying is you actually, if I recall correctly, Dr. Behe, you looked at public health data that showed that basically it takes about 10 to the 20th cells before resistance to chloroquine will arise. And that's a lot of cells, right? I mean, that shows that it's a complicated pathway. Yeah, that's right. It's really an astronomical number. It's hard to imagine. 10 to the 20th is 100 billion billion. It's the number of stars in the universe, or like I said, a really an astronomical number. And yet it takes that many for random mutations, just errors when a cell is copying its genetic information. It takes that many chances to stumble across the right mutation for this thing to become resistant. Or mutations. If I recall correctly, Dr. B, you inferred from the rarity of this trait that it might take multiple mutations before resistance arises in malaria. Is that basically correct? Yeah, that's right. It's easy to see because the malaria parasite, it has its DNA, which has about 10 million or so units, just like humans have 3 billion in there. This is smaller. It's got about 10 million. So if you think how often would a particular mutation arise, it turns out that every 100 million or so, which is a lot, but not as big as the number required to give resistance to the parasite, every 100 or a million or so would have a mutation at any place in the genome. And the number of parasites in a sick person is much greater than that, over a thousand times greater than that. So any person who was sick with malaria, given a particular drug, would be expected, if it required just one mutation for resistance, they would expect it to harbor at least one parasite with resistance already. And so drugs would be pretty much useless. But as I said, chloroquine has been effective for a long, long time. So I deduced in the edge of evolution, and other people in, in the field had two, although they didn't play it up like I did, that you would need at least two mutations 
two and separate places in order to confer resistance. And since you need two, then that would be essentially the square of the probability of getting one. So if you can follow me here, a little bit of math, if it's one times 10 to the eighth, one times 10 to the ninth is the probability of getting one, then it's one times 10 to the 16th or one times 10 to the 18th or so to get two. And we're getting up close to that astronomical number of one times 10 to the 20th. So I thought it was pretty straightforward deduction to say that chloroquine resistance requires two separate mutations. And you make an interesting point in one of your articles on evolution news and views about this. You point out that resistance to another anti-malaria drug called atovaquone, you point out that it only takes maybe only three patients before we find resistance to atovaquone. And that really suggests that in that case, maybe only one mutation is needed, but takes a lot longer when you need two mutations. That's right. It's been documented that you do only need one mutation to confer resistance to that drug atovaquone. And this might confuse people who don't do the math, but it's kind of like this. What are the odds of your winning, say, the Powerball lottery? And they're pretty slim. Okay. Well, suppose you had to win the Powerball lottery twice or had to get two tickets drawn, two separate winning tickets drawn before you got some reward or other. It wouldn't be twice as difficult as getting one ticket. It would be the square. It would be the improbability of getting the first one times the improbability of getting the second one. And that's how these numbers can build up real quickly to astronomical values. Okay, well, I want to revisit this argument in just a moment here of what exactly you argued in the Edge of Evolution on this point. But before we go there, let's talk about what many of your critics said in response to this argument in The Edge of Evolution. What did they argue? Well, the book was reviewed by some big names in big journals, and the journal Science and the journal Nature and New York Times and so on. And pretty much uniformly, those critics said that, no, 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 that's silly. We know that resistance could develop one at a time. And therefore, the probability of getting resistance would be a lot higher, a lot easier than I was making it out to be, which I thought was strange because it was a result reported in the literature that the chloroquine resistance was an event of likelihood 1 in 10 to the 20th. And that was reported by a man named Nicholas White, who is a very eminent malaria researcher from Cambridge University in England. But nonetheless, that's what they said. Now, Dr. Behe, to go back to what we were talking about just a moment ago, about what you argued in The Edge of Evolution, what I found interesting about the response from critics was that it actually did not touch upon the core of your argument. Even if the critics were right, and chloroquine resistance could evolve in sort of a sequential manner, where each mutation gives you an additional advantage, perhaps giving increased resistance to chloroquine. That was not necessary to your argument that they had to arise in a sort of simultaneous manner. What you argued in your book is that whatever it takes to produce chloroquine resistance seems to be a simultaneous set of mutations, but even if it isn't, whatever it takes, it takes 10 to the 20th cells. That's a empirically observed public health data point. And then you went on to say that let's imagine that you need to get a trait that is twice as complex as chloroquine resistance. Well, now you've got to square 10 to the 20th cells, and you're going to get 10 to the 40th cells before you get a trait like that. And you point out that that is basically the number of cells that have lived over the entire history of Earth. So if there was a trait out there that basically was twice as complicated as chloroquine resistance or needed two of those types of mutations before giving you an advantage, then that could never arise in the history of the Earth, and it would be beyond what you call the edge of evolution. But your argument there, and that was really, I think, the core meat of your argument in the book, that did not require that whatever mutations led to an individual example of chloroquine resistance, it didn't require those mutations had to be simultaneous or sequential. They could have been either. All that it required was that it took 10 to the 20th cells you reasonably inferred that it probably was simultaneous due to the great rarity of the number of cells. But when the critics came back at you and said, oh, look, clearly it has to be sequential because we can't evolve things when it's simultaneous mutations, they actually didn't appreciate the strength of your argument, that you weren't saying it had to be one way or the other. Yes, that's right. But you have to be a little bit careful. If it required sequential mutations and they were all each individually favorable, then you would expect it to have arisen pretty quickly and pretty easily. You could probably think up some scenario where the delay in the resistance happening was due to 
the ability of malaria to be transferred from human to human. So essentially, it's not the origin, but the spreading uh, that was the bottleneck. But if the mechanism didn't require simultaneous mutations, it could be explained by multiple deleterious mutations that stick around in the population for a little bit at some level and eventually get another lucky mutation, which will put us over the edge. But then that would still require that one in 10 to the 20th chances. So any way you look at it, it was very, very likely, very reasonable and much less of a fragile scenario than the uh, reviewers thought. Well, Dr. Behe, I think we're running out of time for this first podcast, but I want to ask you some more questions about a paper that came out in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, which I think really vindicated your argument. So will you stay on with us for another show? Sure, I'd be happy to. All right, great. Well, I'm Casey Luskin with ID the Future. Stay tuned for more with Dr. Michael Behe about the origin of chloroquine resistance and what it means for the edge of evolution. Thanks for listening.